a third Democratic governor rejects Born Alive legislation to protect babies who survive abortions. Montana Governor Steve Bullock last week vetoed the state's Born Alive Infant Protection Act, which would have protected babies born alive from failed abortions. This week, Bullock announced he is seeking the Democratic presidential nomination. Bullock's veto follows North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper's veto of similar legislation. And Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers comments that he rejects the Born Alive bill in his state. For a reaction, we speak with a governor who affirms life. Governor Matt Bevin joins us now from Louisville, Kentucky. Welcome back to the show. Great to be with you today. It really is. Governor, we have seen in recent days and weeks three governors, all Democrats, reject their state's version of born alive legislation, which protects babies who survive abortions. The governors of Wisconsin, North Carolina, and now Montana. Do you have a message to your fellow governors who have rejected this legislation? Again, I can't speak for another person. I can speak for my thoughts on this. The arguments that I've heard that it somehow doesn't serve a purpose, that it's perhaps redundant, that we already have such laws on the books. I'm not sure that we do, and that argument is fairly weak. It would seemingly be the same argument you might say for why have airbags in a car, because we already have uh, a seatbelt. Mm. Uh, to, to protect a human life and to ask a doctor to take responsibility for protecting that human life, and to hold them accountable if they do not, especially given that they have taken an oath to do so, and in fact uh, are licensed to do so, would be irresponsible. And I would just encourage governors, be bold. Don't be politically opportunistic. Don't be beholden to outside interests that are going to help you politically. But be bold and do the right thing. All of this discussion of Born Alive Bill comes in the wake of extreme abortion legislation we are seeing pop up in various states, including in New York. Governor, what role do states' rights play in defending the sanctity of life? What can be done at the state level? Well, if you look at the Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, it says that these particular uh, responsibilities of the federal government, not spelled out in the Constitution, are the responsibilities of the states and of the people. And prior to Roe v. Wade, that's exactly how this particular issue is handled, the question of life and of abortion and the delivery of abortion. But Roe v. Wade read into the Constitution through penumbras and emanations, things that didn't actually exist there. It was a travesty of the, the court. And uh, the net result of it was uh, the decision to take away from the states the responsibility that was theirs. I think this will ultimately be returned back to the states. In the meantime, states like ours have passed very uh, intentional laws related to things like informed consent and ultrasounds. We won this uh, at the Sixth Circuit. We've also had laws passed against a 20-week ban. That has not been challenged. We've had laws uh, passed that would outlaw the incredibly brutal uh, practice of dismemberment mm -hmm. of a live uh, baby in the womb. Uh, and then we also have a couple of more recent bills as well, a heartbeat bill uh, that is being challenged right now in federal court. Uh, and then more recently one that I think will make its way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and may be very well involved in the ultimate decision making as it relates to Roe v. Wade. And that is a non-eugenics bill. We passed a bill here mm -hmm. in this past session in Kentucky that says you can't kill a child based on its race, based on its gender, or based on some perceived disability. Right. We used language very similar to what we find in the Americans with Disabilities Act and other federal statutes that are already on the laws and already on the books, I should say. And I want to come back to that bill shortly, but first, and what is good news for the pro-life movement? We just saw Georgia Governor Brian Kemp sign a heartbeat bill into law in his state. Can you, Governor, speak to the pressure that pro-life governors face when signing pro-life bills into law? There is pressure, of course, politically, but here's the, the thing, and I think so many of your viewers understand this, to do the right thing is the right thing. And sometimes, of course, in pol politics and in other areas, it's easier for some to do the easy wrong than to do the difficult right. But I think we have a moral obligation, uh, and for many it's maybe a religious obligation, but I think even uh, for those for whom it's not religious-based, it's moral to mm -hmm. save a human life, as our founders understood. 
we were endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights that government has no ability or right to take from us because they did not give them to the, to us. Absolutely. And Governor, as you mentioned, you recently signed a bill banning abortion based on the baby's gender, race, or a prenatal diagnosis of a disability, and now the ACLU is suing. Governor, why is this bill necessary, and how do you plan to defend it in court? It's interesting because I think the, uh, the guild is coming off the lily uh, on the other side of this issue. For so many years, people made the commentary that, well, we want it to be rare. They don't really want it to be rare, and now they don't even say that anymore. They're not mm -hmm. pretending that anymore. And so the ACLU, among others, is quick to sue as our attorney generals. I've been sued on many of these by my own attorney general. And in fact, he refuses to defend these, even though they've been overwhelmingly passed by our legislature. Mm -hmm. I think the reason people are doing this is because they're beholden to the pro-abortion industry that pays a lot of money to politicians. Planned Parenthood is a big disseminator of monies to get people elected because this is a very profitable uh, business for them. And so what is it that, that folks like myself can do? Just continue to stand firm. We have a responsibility to do so. Are we going to be sued? Yes, that's okay. We are standing on the side of what is right. And just as there have been laws of the land overturned in the past, like the Dred Scott ruling of 1857 that said blacks were not human, that they were two-thirds of a human, that they could be bought and sold and treated as property, there were people that were outraged and said, this is not right. The same battles are going on today. And just because it has been previously ruled upon does not make it right. And so we are standing firm and we will continue to do so regardless of the money and the reasons and, the, and the, just the evil, frankly. Uh, that is opposing us on the other side of the equation. Right. And finally, Governor, we only have a minute left. I'd like to get your quick reaction to recent video that's been circulating of Pennsylvania State Representative Brian Sims harassing a woman who is praying outside of a Planned Parenthood. As a husband and a father of nine, what do you want to say to pro-abortion men who harass and bully? Grow up. Uh, you know, really act your age. This kind of irresponsible behavior and, and then streaming it, filming yourself, this sort of voyeuristic, uh, narcissistic approach uh, to trying to garner attention for yourself uh, is pretty pathetic, frankly. And I would encourage those uh, that were on the receiving end of that to prosecute that to the fullest extent of the law. It's inexcusable for somebody in elected office or otherwise, but if you're going to be an elected official and represent people, um, do it like an adult. Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin, thank you for your pro-life leadership. You're welcome. To continue our conversation, we're joined now by Marilyn Musgrave, a former U.S. representative for the state of Colorado and now the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List. Congresswoman, welcome back. It's good to be here. What was your reaction to this latest veto of the Born Alive legislation? Well, it's, it's absolutely disgraceful. It's amazing. When you poll this, people really get it. Mm -hmm. A little baby that survives a failed abortion deserves the same care that a, any other little preemie would get. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's amazing that someone could be this hard-hearted. What role then can a pro-life governor have in upholding the sanctity of life at the mm. state level? Well, they can make all the difference in the world. Mm. You know, I was in the state legislature in Colorado, and uh, the governor is the head of the state. And if mm -hmm. a governor is pro-life, and going to sign pro-life bills into law, like Matt Bevins mm -hmm. in Kentucky, oh my goodness, they've banned dismemberment abortion, they've banned abortion that would discriminate against a baby based upon its sex, race, or disability. The heartbeat bill has been passed. So it sends a signal to the legislature, I'm here for you and I'm gonna sign those bills into law. Very different mm -hmm. than what Governor Bullock did in Montana. And you know, I thought he was looking to have his image be one of a moderate. Hmm. But that is, uh, you know, vetoing born alive, that's not a moderate position. It's very, very extreme. Very extreme. And Congressman, we are seeing Democratic presidential candidates get asked about born alive legislation, and they are just flat out denying that this kind of legislation is necessary. So what advice do you have for viewers if they hear that kind of talking point from others? Well, first of all, don't accept that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not very good reporting on abortion from states, and there's mm -hmm. a reason for that. You know, the pro-abortion crowd doesn't want voters to know what has happened in their state, but we do know 
from the Center for Disease Control that between 2003 and 2014, there were at least 143 babies that were born alive during attempted abortions. We do know that in the last few years, over five states, there have been like 23 babies born alive. And in Florida alone in 2018, there were six babies that were born alive and we don't know what happened to them. Mm. But we do know that they should be given the same care that any preemie would receive. We need better reporting across the country. But yes, it is factual that babies survive abortion and those precious little babies deserve medical care. Absolutely. And finally, you were at that massive pro-life rally in Philadelphia last week in response to State Representative Brian Sims' harassment of pro-lifers praying outside of a Planned Parenthood. What was your message there at that rally? I'm appalled mm -hmm. that a state representative would act that way towards an older woman, mm -hmm. uh, towards teenage girls. And how sad it is, though, that he is so angry over this. And here we were. I mean, I couldn't see the end of the crowd to my left or to my right. It was a beautiful crowd of pro-life people, uh, very loving, very gentle, but very firm in saying, we will be here. We will be praying on the sidewalks. We will be defending innocent life. We're not going to go away, mm -hmm. even if you bully us. That is powerful. Thank you so much for being there and for being here. Marilyn Musgrave of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you for being here. It's always great to be here. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.